we talk about the evolution of the legal profession. This certainly is an area of evolution. I don't even know when I started when I started a law firm, my goal was not to get fired every day. I didn't really think about, you know, was I going to be a partner? Was certainly not. Was I ever going to lead a group or be the chair of the firm? And we've watched in the last decade even more changes in the legal profession related to how firms have fared. You know, Dewey and LaBeouf was four years ago, five years ago. Um, what have you seen? if anything, in terms of the way the management of law firms has changed or the way the profession has changed sort of in the wake of situations like Dewey and LaBeouf? And do you think we're going to see more of those situations going forward? Well, I have a particular view about all of this. Um, and you've heard me on panels before talk about this. Mm -hmm. I believe that there won't necessarily be a Dewey and LaBeouf kind of situation. There may, but it's roughly, it's largely and roughly a random thing occurring where um, performance out, um, performance was more important than uh, doing the right thing at the right time. I think we all are running things that are different than law firms. We're running legal enterprises that are businesses. And therefore, we have responsibility to a whole range of stakeholders that we didn't necessarily think that we had responsibility to before. So I view my role and our role as senior management to be stewards for a whole range of people. The saddest thing that happened at Dewey and LaBeouf was the fact that there were people who had worked at that firm or their predecessor firms for 40 years, 50 years, in roles that were clearly supportive of their lawyers. And those people may have been the principal breadwinners of their family, and they were out of work. And it wasn't going to be so easy for them to find work again. The lawyers were going to land on their feet. Most of the lawyers have landed on their feet. So from my point of view, I believe that I have responsibility to the entire firm. Mm -hmm. And whether that's a secretary or that is a uh, receptionist or it's the person who delivers the mail or whomever it is, wherever they are in the world. And the day we lose that and the day we lose respect for those people, giving what they give to the law firm on a day-to-day -day basis is the day, that the, is the, day that, the, that the profession as a whole is really troubled. I don't think we live in a troubled profession right now. I think there are troubling things that happen and we all, we all address them and deal with them uh, because you got a lot of molecules that are banging into one another on a day-to-day -day basis and things are bound to happen. But for me, it's really the broader responsibility to a whole range of people that I respect and believe make a contribution to the firm that is equal but different. Yeah, and I think, I, I do think there have been changes in law firm management generally, or at least maybe a heightened awareness of certain things in the aftermath of some of the things that have come before. Um, I think certainly at our firm, uh, we've always been very focused on no debt, uh, we're, we focus on fiscal responsibility. That's been a long history at Morgan Lewis, but I do think that it has become something that law firm leaders and partners look at much more closely. I think that, you know, in, in a law firm, you have a couple big expenses. One is talent and the other is real estate. I think that people are more mindful about their expenses, some of the more exaggerated risky expenses in terms of real estate and things like that. I do think that law firm leaders are relying more than they used to on experts in other roles, whether it's in HR, whether it's in finance, whether it's in operations. I think law firm uh, leaders have finally recognized that you know maybe partners are not the best people to do each of mm -hmm. those things in every instance. And I think your point about the overall sense of responsibility uh, is definitely true. I certainly feel it. You know, when people ask me what's changed the most about becoming the chair of the firm, 
I've been at Morgan Lewis for 35 years. I've always felt loyalty and responsibility to the firm. But when you become the chair of an organization, you are responsible for everyone in that organization, as you said, and for the stability and for the legacy and for the longevity. And so I think you do take that very seriously. It's hard for me to say whether you take it more seriously in a post-Dewey world. I think it might have been the same either way. But I do think that law firms are watching some of those economics and expenses in a way differently uh, than maybe they did before. And I think partners are expecting that it of their law firm management. It was clearly a wake-up call uh, on a lot of different levels. Um, it is also w one point that you've made that I completely agree with is that I believe, generally speaking, lawyers are lousy businessmen. Um, they are very good at giving advice. They're not so good at running a large-scale business. And therefore, you need to really put people in place that are skilled and have had the experience and responsibility to be able to really manage something that is a very fragile personal service organization. The other thing that makes us different, and you and larger law firms generally, is that legal enterprises are, have lots of stakeholders. Public corporations have lots of stakeholders. Most of those stakeholders, in, in the case of public corporations, are passive. Yeah, you have an institutional investor who may raise a flag every now and then about this, that, and the other, but the vast majority of people are pretty passive. Our stakeholders are very active. We have the largest concentration <laughs> of activist shareholders yep. and stakeholders <laughs> of any profession out there. Yep. And as a result of that, because they can always vote with their feet mm -hmm. and our assets go up and down the elevator every day, it's very important for us as leaders of firms to project stability, as you said, confidence, <laughs> and honesty and transparency. And I think the biggest issue that we could learn from the Dewey debacle was the lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so we've talked a little bit about talent management. Uh, I don't think necessarily, unless you want to discuss it anymore. I mean, we're all kind of in the same boat. But the biggest issue right now for a lot of us has to do with cybersecurity and data privacy. So tell me, what are you guys doing about this? So we're doing a lot about it, but I think the evolution of this is really interesting to watch. So first of all, internally at our firm, you know, our investments in technology, and I'm sure this is true of yours, are amazing. I had our uh, chief information officer speak at our advisory board meeting recently about all of the things we do, all the protections we have, all the money we spend, all the resources we have just to make sure that we are safe in terms of our own privacy and cybersecurity. But we also represent many, many clients, including those in heavily regulated industries and in financial industries who have increasing requirements for law firms. And we, like every other major provider of them, have security audits by them. There are certain things that they require that their law firms are doing. We're very lucky because we score very well on those because we've had these programs in place for so long. But one of the things that's been really interesting to me in the last six months is the number of clients who have either told me directly or who have communicated to us through RFPs or in other ways how important the law firm's cybersecurity is to their decision about what providers to use. And I actually had more than two, three different general counsel tell me that they were shifting some of their work from smaller and medium-sized firms because they did not think those firms could meet their cybersecurity requirements. I'm not sure that's something that we all kind of saw coming. And, and I know from our own situation how incredibly expensive, how incredibly time-consuming it is to do the things that our clients are demanding. And those of us who deal with either regulated institutions or ones where we have a lot of customer um, information and, and private information, 
those clients are expecting their law firms to be at the very top of their game on cybersecurity, and we have to do that. Um, I'm sure for you guys, being so many different places in the world, that's a particularly interesting challenge. And how do you maintain your global collaborative footprint mm -hmm. while at the same time dealing with the cybersecurity issues that are more acute in some regions of the world? Well, I think, like everything else, it's a uh, one has to decide as the leader of the firm where are the priorities, mm -hmm. and cybersecurity and data privacy is a huge is obviously a huge priority for us. So, when one has a legal enterprise of this magnitude, one has investment dollars. Where is the most protective mm -hmm. things, and what are the most protective things one can do? in order to utilize those investment dollars in order to protect the clients and protect the law firm. It's a good question, and I was asked recently as to whether I thought that cyber breaches could create a threat to a law firm that would actually be devastating. I think it's not necessarily an existential threat to a law firm because, frankly, it's not something that the law firm does or doesn't do because the clients have the same problem as we have. They're trying to figure out how best to prevent hacking and so on and so forth. We all know that we've been hacked. The question is at what level have we been hacked and what have been the repercussions of it? And how much did you put in place in order to protect yourself from the likelihood of, of it happening? I think we've all probably done as good a job as we can possibly do. I do think what you're saying about regional firms that don't necessarily have the investment dollars in order to protect themselves that way or will suffer some loss of business and so on and so forth. But I, I really believe that even if you're state of the art, you know that there's going to be some reputational breach that is going to happen and how are you going to manage it. Um, we do tabletop exercises, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, times where we do false hacking and so on and so forth so that we can actually see how the processes are working. It is completely collaborative globally for sure. Um, uh, you probably know uh, Saxby Chambliss, who was the head of one of the leading members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, is a, now a partner of the firm, very highly regarded guy in the cyber area, data privacy area. So part of what happens is, in his approach to clients, he will then come back and say to us, okay, this is what we're preaching to the clients, we better be doing this for ourselves as well. Um, it's clearly, I think, one of the three top issues we've got. Um, I do think this issue, not only of cyber, but you know how one deals with real estate and all the other things that you've raised are equally important, but nothing goes to the heart of the law firm quite as much as clients not feeling that their information is protected. Absolutely, and it, it, it's so important. And it does have so many different technological overlays, including the constant changes in technology. And when we look at technology in, in other ways, one of the other things that has been on everybody's mind is the whole issue of artificial intelligence. You know, is Watson going to replace junior lawyers? Uh, you know, artificial intelligence, even things like predictive coding, what impact is that going to have on the future of litigation? What are your thoughts about artificial intelligence and, uh, and do we really have to worry that 70% of what lawyers do will be done by machines in the next 10 years? Or do you think that there is sort of a, a, a lesser impact, but I assume still some impact? I'm not immediately worried about this. I think the a client it's it's important to be as productive and as efficient as one can possibly be. The segmentation of the market, which and segmentation of skill sets, 
uh, is something that's not going away. The question is, is there going to be a robot or a machine that replaces a lawyer and a lawyer's judgment? Not in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there will be things that we have traditionally relied on, uh, like uh, e-discovery and so on and so forth, that are going to continue and get more sophisticated and will result in shrinking of size of incoming classes and, and law firms generally. I think it's a good question in the United States as to whether the profession is massively overlawyered and whether we ought to be in a position where we're saying to the world, hey, like every other profession, we are reaching conclusions about what's the best and most productive way for the law firm to retain its prominence and, and success as, a, as an, a commercial enterprise. Um, lawyers have a way, I think, of wanting to have the newest gadget. They don't necessarily want to pay for the newest <laughs> gadget, but they want the newest gadget. They want somebody else to pay for the newest gadget. Uh, but we have to be pretty careful, I think, before we leap into this in any material way. I mean, w we've recently uh, promoted an internal program with Kira, and it's been, I think, widely received as being very helpful to people, particularly in transactional work and so on and so forth. But, you know, talking about having somebody push a button and say, okay, you're going to be my seventh year associate on an M&A transaction, mm -hmm. not happening anytime soon in my mind. Yeah, I think the interesting issue here, there's really two of them. First is the decisions you make around technology. You know, we started almost 20 years ago now with an e-discovery program because a partner and an associate really saw that the computerization of things was going to have an impact. And that's grown into a huge program for us, and it's been a great one. You know, we don't charge by the page or the person, we charge by the gigabyte now, the trigabyte. You know, we have all of that technology, but I don't think we could start it today. I think that we've, we've been able to be successful at it because we've been doing it for so long. But that doesn't replace lawyers, it just changes what the lawyers are doing. I think the big challenge for all of us, frankly, as a profession, and it includes law schools and everybody else, is how we replace the training that people used to get from doing some of the things that now are done differently mm -hmm. or are disaggregated. I often feel that I learned to be a great trial lawyer by crawling around the floor, opening boxes, reading documents, and realizing when I was over on that corner of the room that I saw something that connected back to something I'd seen hours before and sort of putting that story together in your mind, it's very unusual anymore for that to be done by the person who's going to try the case. So one of the things I think we all have to focus on and one of the things we're focusing on is training people so that they ultimately develop that judgment that you used to get just through a series of steps that you make along the way. So the real question is how far along the continuum the, the technology kind of takes over and then are there things that you have to do uh, to kind of replace some of that on the job training and that's what I think a lot of firms are struggling with and a lot of clients are struggling with because they're paying senior associates they want to make sure that they're people who really have had a lot of robust experience. And the, the further you encroach on that, I think, you know, we'll, it will be a challenge for law firms going forward for a while.